Hello all, this is the Owl, and before we get started on this absolutely stupidly huge video, yay 9000 subs, why do I always do this to myself? Three quick things. Firstly, as I will remind you in a bit, the introduction portion for this is going to be long, like 20 minutes long. Keep in mind that once the series is done, the final compiled version will be at least 12 hours long, so it'll hopefully seem a bit less excessive then. I've just got a lot to say about this manga. Secondly, part of this video was recorded as best as I could during something of a windstorm so there will be about 15 minutes of audio at the one hour mark. That might sound a tiny bit janky. My apologies, but I have to do this as best as I can in between looking after the other owls. Aside from Mrs. Owl's art, this is a one-man show. Thirdly, oh, hang on, here comes Mrs. Owl. Let's see what she wants. Hello all, this is the other owl and Mr. Owl has given me the go-ahead to speak to you about my now open art commissions. I do digital art, mostly pixel art, and can do everything from emotes to avatars and portraits to full animations. You might have actually seen my work on the Discord server with some of the custom emotes, and of course, Mr. Owl's own avatar here on YouTube. Anyway, hit me up on Discord or my business email. All links, as always, in the description if you want something and we can talk. And if you're interested in becoming a patron, for the next while, you'll get half off. The commission, I mean. With that, back to your regularly scheduled owl. It is a failing of us older folks, especially those of us heading through middle and towards old age, to forget what it was like to be a teenager, especially an older teenage boy. A lot of writers infamously struggle to write teenage characters for this reason. They either behave like adults or like children, except that teenagers aren't adults or children. They are very much their own thing. They have their own way of looking at and interacting with the world. For those of us at 40, walking down a city street in the rain at night alone is basically just ho-hum. But when you're 16, the cool air feels electric on your skin. You are conscious of the stars above, the reflections of neon in the puddles below the smell of cooking drifting out of restaurants, and the distant thump of bass from a parked car. You feel weirdly but acutely lonely, and everything is somehow significant. It's a time when every sense is heightened, and every experience is amped up. Every crush is a great romance, and every rejection a tragedy. Every triumph is the greatest victory of your life, and every failure an utter calamity. Yeah, being a teenager is both amazing and horrible all at the same time. Now, there are tons and tons of manga that attempt to tackle what it's like to be a young man at that awkward age between being a kid and being all grown up. And while a lot of them are admittedly really good, very few capture that unique headspace all that well at all. Holy Land is one that does immediately come to mind, and maybe Great Teacher Onizuka. 
but out of this tiny number of series, it's probably Gantz that remains nearest and dearest to my calcified heart. Note, I didn't say the objective best, but I will say favorite. Seriously, if I ever finish that top 50 list, Gantz is probably going to be top 10. No, I'm not kidding. But why? You ask, do I like this often criticized, problematized, and memed manga so much? Well, that's going to take a while to explain. So for those of you who aren't a fan of long intros, I've hopefully got chapters working now. And even if I'm still boomering it, well, the time codes in the description should work. This is going to be a leviathan video once it's all put together, so this intro will hopefully seem a bit less intrusive then. But Gantz really is a story that needs a long intro, because even covering it to the level of detail that I intend to is daunting, for a variety of reasons. I mean, First of all, where the hell do you even start with something like Gantz? A manga that somehow manages to be, at the same time, divisive, controversial, problematic, disturbing, uplifting, elating, contentious, edgy, juvenile, mature, insightful, stupid, bloody amazing, and just plain old bloody. And, all at the same time, as well as managing to be emotionally devastating in places. Seriously, when this thing lands, it hits like a freight train full of sledgehammers. I am not kidding, or even slightly ashamed to say, this thing has moments that make me frigging cry whenever I read it. Well, I guess you start at the beginning. And with that... Mangaka Hiroya Oku is an industry veteran and also something of a cipher. Fukuoka born, and from my understanding, a longtime Tokyoite, he made a big splash with his first successful manga, Hen, which, yeah, we do not have the time to talk about Hen today, except for saying that I can understand why it was extremely controversial in socially conservative 80s and early 90s Japan. He is better known today for the awesome and really trippy Inuyashiki, which is probably his most critically acclaimed work, despite it being completely and utterly bananas. Oku is a man that, much like his primary inspiration, Gornagai, yes, that Gornagai, loves to push boundaries and, well, more than loves, believes that it is essential for a piece of media to be considered worth reading. Although, you know, with how much Oku clearly loves to poke the bear, even now, it's hard to know how serious he is half the time. Oku is also someone that wears the things he enjoys on his sleeve and incorporates them into his stories. So, what does Oku like? Well, he likes technology, spaghetti westerns, video games, mecha, explosions, katanas, large breasts, surrealism, action movies, science fiction, horror movies, boobs, horror action movies, gore, big robots, violence, asses, violent video games, tits, dinosaurs, butts, body horror, guns, hot chicks, motorbikes, sword fights, enormous mammary glands, yakuza stories, vaginas, supermodels, naked women, leather suits, hot chicks, naked ladies, boobs, and you can probably see a theme emerging. This is a man who has been a 16-year-old boy since the 1970s and has never stopped, and I absolutely love him for it, as someone who has tastes that run in a, let's say, similar direction. However, Oku's best-known work, and definitely his most prolific, has to be Gantz. And while it has been somewhat forgotten in the West, although apparently it's really popular in Spanish-speaking countries, does anyone know why? Let me know in the comments. Inspired by, 
a combination of the Western movies Oku liked, such as The Matrix, Die Hard, Men in Black, and Tomb Raider, as well as Japanese reality TV and classic Japanese B and Z flicks of yesteryear, it's quite something to behold. Slightly older Future Owl dropping in to when this was recorded first, but Mrs. Owl literally just informed me that one of the core inspirations of Gantz is, allegedly, Frigging Immortality Inc., the classic science fiction novel by Robert Sheckley, a story about a man who undergoes some kind of body transplant and wakes up in a distant and rather alien future. And if this sounds familiar, it's also the core inspiration behind Futurama, aka the best adult-oriented Western animated show that isn't Venture Brothers, as well as elements of Warren Ellis's mind-bogglingly good Transmetropolitan series. Anyway, it's also a manga that, while somewhat derided today as the best worst manga of all time, was as important for the industry in its own right as things like Violence Jack, Devil Man, or Dragon Ball. <sighs> R.I.P. Toriyama, you are gone far too soon. Much as with the aforementioned manga, you can find Gantz's DNA in a whole bunch of stuff today from power fantasy isekais, which it formalized many tropes of, to seinen action series, and that's before we get into its art and the use of technology, which we'll talk about in more detail later on. And yes, while Gantz absolutely has its flaws, to the point where I'm almost willing to call it endearingly scuffed, from an uneven and widely hated start, to some pacing issues, a bunch of plot threads that kind of go nowhere, and a final arc that, let's just say, remains divisive, it's still bloody amazing, at least if you're in the right headspace for it, or have a weakness for overly earnest storytelling. And, to this day, remains a cult staple, and it still gets spin-offs, including the really good Gantz E. However, as mentioned, when approaching making a video series on Gantz, well, it's sort of tricky, and not just because the bloody thing is almost 40 volumes long, extremely story and character dense, and at times amazingly ambiguous and confusing, especially towards the end. See, Gantz pushed boundaries hard in a post-Berserk seinen landscape. I've even heard it described as the manga that tried to out-berserk berserk, and yeah, I can see it. This manga is so extreme, so gory, so booby, and so perverted, occasionally stepping so close to the edge of is this action horror or just weird porn territory that this is going to be, without a doubt, my most censored video to date, even more than Vitiators. Maybe half the battle sequence panels will either have to be omitted or heavily censored, and there are some sequences that I cannot show you. For instance, a lengthy fight with a huge monster made entirely out of, let's say, female naughty bits. Hell, there's one series, likely the most notorious in Gantz, that is so controversial and has aged so poorly that, to be frank, I probably can't even describe it in any great detail. Those who've read this thing know what I'm talking about, and just how much there is going to be to unpack there. And this brings me to point two. Some folks have been asking me for a while now to include a more comprehensive list of triggers and warnings regarding the content of these videos and, okay, keep in mind I am an old man and not terribly used to that stuff, but it is something I have considered. <sighs> See that bit in Satogashi that I know some people took issue with? I responded to the pinned comment there if you want to know why. So, as I do want to avoid spoilers, and I know that especially for Gantz, no warning I can give will be comprehensive enough for everyone, let me say this right now. Gantz is one 
hell of a manga, even by today's standards. It's not quite Uziga White level, but it's not far off sometimes. If you have anything that you find personally upsetting enough to straight up nope out of a video, from bigotry to sexual assault to abuse, Gantz is not the manga for you, and even this video might cross some lines. So, while I would love to say just go and read it, please, please make sure that you have an extremely strong stomach and are in a good place mentally right now because this is a manga that might rattle you. Point three, Gantz is clearly a Frankenstein's monster in many respects of a lot of different media. The amount of pop culture nods are bananas, and I will simply never manage to list them all, let alone explain them all. So if I do miss one that you notice, please post it in the comments. It'll be great fun seeing what you come up with. And who knows, I might work out some kind of reward for the best one. Point number four is one that you likely won't care about, but it's the core reason why I have held off on this for a while. See, Gantz, like Berserk, was picked up a long time ago by Dark Horse, but unlike Berserk, they retained ownership and, well, Dark Horse doesn't really do digital releases. While they have released two different versions of the manga, the most recent being the very high quality omnibus editions that I own, along with Once Upon a Time the original Japanese volumes, there is, to my knowledge, no digital release of this thing, and ahem, even unofficially, of the latter half of this thing outside of fan relations. So we'll get there when we get there, but if you're watching the full compiled video in I guess 2025, hello future you, and if the quality and style seem to get weird about halfway through, this is why. Dark Horse also do have a tendency to trance things into English differently in that they will replace Japanese cultural phenomena with Western ones, much like the Phoenix Wright games did with ramen and burgers. I'll point this out where I can. Point number five. Unlike the manga landscape of today, Turn of the Millennium Japan was a bit different, and as far as Western readership of manga goes, the subculture was microscopic even in Japan, and Oku isn't a manga car known for explaining a whole lot. And this is all led to the manga not only being a bit confusing in places, but also the reader needing to infer their own understanding of how stuff works within the world, or even what stuff is called. And this has, over the past bloody hell 25 years almost, damn it I'm old, led to a lot of different headcanons forming on discussion boards and forums. And yes, some of these will be pretty personal, due to me reading and talking about this with a small group of foreigners in Japan way back in 2004, if I recall. For instance, this will always be called an H-gun to me, and these will always be called coil suits, even though I know the former is technically incorrect, and the latter is due to a superficial connection with an unrelated and obscure video game series. And no, don't even mention the Gantz manuals, I read the first one a while back and it lost me when it started contradicting the manga itself and calling a rifle a shotgun. So if you're some kind of Gantz purist, please take everything I say here with a fair bit of charity. Point six, Gantz is a bit of an odd duck, structurally speaking. I was initially going to break this series up into volumes, but Gantz does not divide neatly into volumes. Then I was going to do arcs, but uh, it also doesn't break down well into arcs at least not until quite a bit later on, and this is going to be a very long series. So, as Gantz does follow a formula to some degree of reliability in terms of the fact that, after the prologue, 
It sort of goes for a mission into mission, mission into mission style. I will likely split these videos into missions or hunts, a term that both the fandom and Oku himself seems to prefer, and one intermission segment, at least until we reach the final arc. And this brings me finally to point number seven. Gantz is, in and of itself, enormous. The biggest manga I've attempted by maybe a factor of four. This means that not only will I not be covering every single beat of every single fight, every relationship, or every funny moment, or what have you, I will also be ignoring all the stuff added later on. So again, no Gantz manuals, no Gantz sequels, no spin-offs, no anime, no movies. I will, however, be going fairly deep into Japanese cultural nods, as Gantz is just such a perfect, well, I would have to say period piece of turn of the millennium urban Japan that I would be terribly remiss not to. <sighs> and with that absolute bastard of an intro segment taken care of, Let's get into the meat and potatoes here. Today, we begin our journey into Gantz. I hope you enjoy your stay. Right off the bat, let me say this much. Gantz does not start especially strong. The first, let's not say arc, as again, this is a difficult term to use for this manga, but at least the first hunt or mission, as well as the entire prologue, is pretty widely regarded to be at best flawed, and at worst incredibly focused on being edgy, gross, horny and shocking, as well as just bad. However, I'm not quite that down on it, but I will admit that it does take up until Hunt 3 to really get good, and Hunt 5 is where the manga hits its stride. Anyways, we open by meeting our main character, Kei Kurono, a salty little douchebag of a 15 year old. He's smug, apathetic, resentful, and solipsistic in a way that, yeah, is very common of teenagers, especially teenagers of that era. I want you to keep this in mind as we go through. K is one of my favorite manga protagonists of all time, but starting out, it's going to be really hard to understand why. For now, just keep in mind that, well, he's a 15-year-old boy in the year 2000, because Oku does do a really fantastic job of drilling down into that headspace. He is reading a girly mag on the subway, when an old lady approaches him, asking for help navigating the rails, and he basically blows her off with a sneer. And right off the bat, there is so much to talk about here. See, Gantz, as mentioned, was published at the turn of the millennium in Japan, and it is a perfect snapshot, not only of what life was like back then, naturally amped up to 12, this is an Oku manga of course, but of the attitudes people had. What do I mean? Well, after World War II, and with the USA sensing the incoming Cold War, they invested heavily into the Japanese economy, likely due to its incredible strategic value. And this led to a period known as the economic miracle, running all the way from 1945-ish until the 1990s, leading to Japan becoming the second strongest economy in the world, and massively prosperous. However, this bubble did eventually burst, and this led to a severe recession in the 90s and 2000s, which are today often referred to as Japan's lost years or lost period. This was characterized by mass layoffs, general downsizing, and societal strife not exactly helped by the increase in violence, both gang and otherwise, terrorist attacks, a cataclysmic earthquake, a rise in childhood delinquency, and political upheaval. 
the birth rate had also been declining, and with an increasingly top-heavy and aging society, the fairly robust social support systems in place started to become strained. In response, people began to desert even larger towns en masse, heading for metropolitan centres like Tokyo and Osaka in search of work, hollowing smaller towns out further in a vicious cycle, as the more businesses that left, the fewer jobs remained. I really wish I could tell you that this has improved. At the same time, the younger generations began to realise that the prosperity that the previous generations had enjoyed was not going to be their lot at all. There were simply too many people and not enough jobs, even in the cities, especially for younger people. This led to a ton of apathy and resentment towards both older folks and society as a whole exacerbated by the rise of the internet and cell phones, and this kicked off a full-on culture clash between city and country as well as old and young. Well, at least they didn't need to go through grunge, there's always an upside. Kay's attitude and behaviour is, again, not exactly atypical. And beyond this, Tokyo at the time was experiencing a flood of people seeking work from outside, which people in the city really did not appreciate, and this led to a pretty strong in-group preference among Tokyoites, one that endures today. And being able to navigate the labyrinthine and internationally notorious Tokyo Rail System is something of a shibboleth for Tokyoites, and I can confirm this seriously. If your rail system is so confusing that there are multiple guidebooks for it and not one of them agrees with another one, say no more. K, however, suddenly notices a familiar face. This tall drink of absurdly handsome, an elementary school friend of his, Masaru Kato. He tries not to make eye contact, something else I'm sure all the teenagers will identify with. Seeing friends who knew you at a much younger age, and fearful of them bringing up that time you painted yourself green and pretended to be a Ninja Turtle when you were nine, avoiding them. So yeah, he scorns his old chum and calls him a Yankee, we'll dive into this in the first interlude, don't you worry, but before we can learn any more about this, he sees a drunk and likely homeless guy take a spill onto the tracks. As onlookers gape and comment on it without doing anything, a sadly very Japanese thing to do, K realises that he might just get to see someone creamed by a train, and finds himself morbidly curious. He also has a nasty, supercilious chuckle at Kato, who appears genuinely terrified, saying that Kato was a chicken when he was a kid too. Only, to his absolute horror, he sees him, still shaking, climbing down onto the rails to help, and worse yet, Kato spots him and calls out for assistance. Despite himself, K finds himself doing exactly that, and with some effort, they manage to get the guy up onto the platform and out of harm's way. They then hear the sound of an oncoming train. Terrified, and at Kato's urging, they sprint down the tunnel hell for leather hoping to outdistance the train before it stops, and it looks like they've made it. But nope, too late. They are reminded that this is the express, and the express does not stop here. Ugh, Tokyo subways, man. K turns and sees that, yeah, it's inevitable. He is about to die, and in what might be the first incarnation of the truck sun trope, both are struck at full speed and decapitated. Well, that's certainly a way to start a manga. Suddenly, 
they wake up in a mostly bare apartment alongside several other people. An ominous looking black sphere and yeah, okay. I was holding off mentioning this, but as it's probably one of the most iconic and important contributions of Gantz to manga as a whole, and also something that definitely contributes to its best worst status, is the art. See, Oku was a pioneer when it came to using computer graphics to create manga, combining hand-drawn or at least digitally drawn characters and items with CGI or digitally imported and adapted photographs as well as CGI models, all of which were then composited together digitally. It's an effect that is certainly unique and it does not always work, especially initially. Hell, sometimes it feels like the characters, the inserted digital items, and the backgrounds exist on three different planes, likely due to perspective and lighting looking off at times. His character art is also kind of mediocre at this point, with some very strange faces. On the other hand, his sense of scale and location is phenomenal. And as Oku continues to produce this manga and refine his technique, it starts to work like absolute frigging gangbusters. You will see what I mean later on. And, believe it or not, a lot of these techniques are still used today in manga. Seriously, next time you read one and see a backdrop that looks a bit too photorealistic to be hand-drawn, Take a careful look at characters and other foreground objects and see if you can spot a white or hazy border. According to Mrs. Owl, who knows way more about this stuff than I do, it's allegedly a byproduct of the compositing process, but I'll be perfectly honest, it's all a bit beyond me. Let me know in the comments if you understand this crap. Anyways, it appears, for the most part, that everyone there is just as nonplussed as they are. And, weirdly enough, back at the train tracks, the bodies and all the gore has also vanished, despite the onlookers recalling the incident clearly. Back at the apartment, we get to meet our cast. Masashi, a middle-aged teacher, Goro, an elderly former cancer patient, a young artistic pretty boy who stays nameless aside from his nickname Blondie, and Nishijo, or Nishi, a middle schooler. The last two identify themselves as Yakuza, and that's about it for now. Oh right, there's a dog. Don't mind him. None of them know why they are there, but we do quickly establish that all of them died before they woke up in this room. We get a brief interlude between Kei and Kato, as Kato tells him that he's changed and not in a good way. See, when Kei was in elementary school with him, he was utterly fearless and widely admired by the other students, especially Kato. He then tells Kei that he wanted to be just like him, even though he got sent to a dead-end school, we'll get into that a bit more later on too. Suffice to say, for now, it implies that Kato is poor and likely has a really bad home life. The next bit is one that I just have to explain, not only for story reasons, but because it's so absolutely and utterly insane. As they try to put together exactly what the hell is going on, Masashi tells them that they must be on some kind of reality TV show like Dempa Shonen. And okay, you know what? If you aren't interested in this topic, feel free to skip to the next bit. But for everyone else, we really need to talk about Dempa Shonen. You'll see why. Okay, so, one staple of late 90s and early 2000s television in Japan was reality TV. These programs were an absolute sensation, 
probably even more so than in the West, Japanese reality TV shows ranged from pretty standard fare to cruel prank shows to game shows to the weird stuff, much of which fell within the genre of Gomon Terebi or torture TV, shows basically designed to mess with, humiliate, or inflict suffering on participants for the schadenfreude of viewers. If you've seen 30 Minutes Over Tokyo, that's what's being parodied there. And uh, yeah, people who remember my Dead by Daylight storytime streams might remember that I nearly got fired in my first year in Japan for showing my class that classic episode. I was young, dumb, and full of shirako back then. However, even amongst these programs, Denpa Shonen remains something special. The show essentially preyed on struggling entertainers, offering them money and exposure for participating in bizarre public challenges that ranged from cringy to nasty to embarrassing to outright inhumane to seriously dangerous. These, among other things, resulted in contestants being assaulted, both sexually and otherwise, as well as one nearly straight up dying in a situation that even being charitable could best be viewed as grossly negligent, if not actively malevolent, and audiences lapped this stuff up. As I've said before, it wasn't a great era in Japan, so bread and circuses I guess. The most notorious of these however, and likely the best known season, is that of struggling comedian Tomoaki Hamatsu, most commonly known now as Nasubi or Eggplant due to his distinctive facial features. He found himself blindfolded and locked into an apartment, stripped naked, and was told that he would need to survive purely on magazine sweepstakes winnings until he had saved a million yen approximately $10,000, and if that sounds like a lot now, it was pretty big money in those days. What he wasn't told, however, was that he would be constantly filmed and broadcast live, Truman Show style, except here he would be ridiculed and used for pretty mean-spirited entertainment. It didn't go well, not only because Nasubi quickly began to starve, forced to initially survive off small amounts of rice, and later, I'm not kidding here, dog food, resulting in him rapidly becoming extremely malnourished, but because the producers took every opportunity to secretly mess with and torment him. For instance, sending deliveries of nice smelling food to the apartment, but then taking them away and saying it was a mistake, and then making fun of his distress. However, over time, Nasubi actually got the hang of things, and despite his evidently declining mental health from the complete isolation and torment, after about a year, he did achieve his goal. But rather than giving him a pat on the back, the producers transported him to Korea and told him that he'd need to start over, only this time he would need to earn enough to afford the flight home to Japan. Now, pretty adept at this, he earned the money at high speed, but likely to keep the extremely popular and profitable season going, the producers began changing the rules again, and again, and again. For instance, after he raised the money, they refused to let him go, and told him that no, he must not have heard them clearly, they told him that he had to be able to fly first class. And he did it. So did they let him go? Well, what do you think? However, right after the next declination, likely as Nasubi appeared very close to a complete mental breakdown and quite possibly alt f live on television, Denpa Shonen abruptly ended the show and released him. Accounts differ on what exactly happened after, but apparently he did end up getting a good amount of money and became something of a celebrity after all. 
However, he was left with severe mental health issues, difficulties reintegrating into society, and Nusby visibly struggles even today. This, along with other incidents that made the news, resulted in changes to the law that succeeded in mostly legislating shows like Damper out of existence, although naturally, some did continue online. So yes, my point here is that characters waking up in a situation like Gantz and accepting that they're just part of some kind of mean-spirited but extremely elaborate reality TV gag, even with all the stuff that happens next, is far from unbelievable. And in that era, it wouldn't surprise me if Oku created Gantz partially to criticize shows like Demper Shonan. Anyways. As they continue to talk, the group sees something bizarre and in the first of many, many sequences that I simply cannot show you much of, a, oh, Oku, a stunningly beautiful and buck-naked teenage girl is teleported in piece by piece. K sums it up perfectly in one of the best lines in the early manga. Now I'm pretty sure that I cannot show you this either right now, but her wrists are marked with a lot of blood, suggesting that, yeah, the girl might well have been a contestant on Demper Shonen. To make matters both stranger and worse, one of the Yakuza grab her and drag her off into another room for reasons that I need not go into. But while nobody is brave enough to go and stop it from unfolding, a terrified Kato sacks up and begins to brawl with him. Revealing that, yeah, Kato was actually kind of strong. And note how already we're setting up character stuff. Kato is indeed a bit of a wuss, but this somehow makes his constant displays of bravery and chivalry all the more admirable. The brawl is stopped, however, when a strange song begins emanating from the sphere. Oh yeah, folks who've lived in Japan for a while might actually recognize this, especially if you live out in the country. But for everyone else, well, let's explain. Starting in 1928, in an effort to improve both the health of soldiers and the general citizenry, a special Radio Taiso, or Radio Kalisnetic song, was played every morning at a certain time on the radio as a sign for everyone to get up and exercise. And this was actually banned after World War II, as allegedly it was too militaristic. But a new version of the song was put out in the early 50s and continues to be broadcast every single morning. And although the daily exercise portion has fallen out of fashion, it is still widely practiced by corporation compounds, schools, reformatories, and old people. This Gantz song is a direct and pretty entertaining reference to this weirdness, but keep it in mind as we go through, because much later on in the manga, it's actually going to wrap around to being quite meaningful. The orb then begins displaying a very odd and strangely comedic message, further promoting the group belief that this is just a TV show. But the quiet middle schooler Nishi says that, well, if you were to take the message literally, it's actually quite terrifying. Their old lives are gone, and the new life they've been granted is entirely in the hands of this orb. It continues to display text, now with a photograph, showing a creepy looking kid? Question mark? 
that it describes as the Onion Alien, and, along with his personality traits, tells them to go and kill him. Where? But no, it's serious. The orb opens, revealing several futuristic looking guns, as well as a naked and seemingly unconscious man. The guns, well, we will learn a lot more about them as we go. But for now, we've got three types. The Y gun, the X. No, I am not calling this a shotgun. It is and will always be the X rifle to me. And the X pistol, all of which have strange scopes on them that kind of double as X-rays. This feature, well... Let's just say you'd be surprised at how often this comes in handy. In addition to the guns, they find boxes with their names, often combined with some sort of joke or insult, including one calling Kato, Mr. Kato, which yes, is where that meme comes from. This is what Sulu went by in Japan, by the way. And this makes me suspect one big aspect of Gantz to come is a huge nod to classic Star Trek. See if you can spot it when we get there. Inside the boxes are leather or maybe vinyl suits, but before they can examine them more closely, they start getting teleported away. And just like that, the first hunt begins, and none of you have even the slightest idea what it is that you're in for. Outside, Kay desperately pulls on his suit, while everyone else just kind of does their own thing. Oh, Kato and the others call the dog Butter Dog, and no. No, no, nope. There is literally no way I am going to be able to explain that on YouTube without getting slapped with an age restriction. It's really grody and refers to a scene we've skipped that I honestly can't even mention on YouTube. Google it if you really want, and it will make sense when you read the manga yourself, but trust me, this is one of those things that you probably don't even want to know. Nishi, for some reason, has actually been going around confirming the reality show concept to everyone, telling them that if they can find and kill the alien in one hour, they will win a ton of cash, and this definitely gets most of them moving. But the elderly Goro decides sod it and just goes home. Meanwhile, Masashi stumbles onto the onion alien using a sort of radar device. It's a very creepy and off-putting creature that sort of, but also sort of doesn't resemble a human. I can't actually confirm this, but I heavily suspect that the design is inspired by Bart Simpson. The rest of the hunters join him, and they wonder what comes next. They also comment on, oh yeah, this. The alien absolutely reeks, a smell they describe as rotting tofu, which is a pretty big change from the Japanese, where the smell was described as natto, a fermented soybean dish that, well, tastes like peanut butter stewed in an armpit, has the consistency of snot, and smells like uh, an armpit full of peanut butter. Like a lot of dishes in Japan, I've never been sure how many people actually like the stuff and how many just eat it because Japanese people are expected to like natto. And I guess the principle of anything that tastes this bad must be good for you. Has anyone here tried natto, by the way? What did you think? Let me know in the comments. K and Kato, however, have decided to escort the girl home. K feels like a bit of a tit, not sure quite why he put the strange suit on, as now he looks like a bad cosplayer. But as he's fallen hook, line, and sinker for the girl, he's not about to let her go off with another guy if he can help it. Yeah, as with a lot of stuff in this manga, try to look at it from the perspective of a teenage boy, especially if you were one once. I think that Oku, while he can be hyperbolic at times, absolutely nails it. Unsure of what to do, the Yakuza suddenly gets extremely angry after the alien drips reeking mucus on him. 
slamming it against a door and telling the people running the show to stop. But the creature then breaks free and leaps off a balcony in a definite Men in Black knot, flying a pretty fair distance, but landing badly near the trio, getting quite severely injured from the impact. However, before they can do anything, the other hunters barrel straight past them in pursuit, hooting and hollering, and having a complete blast now. Kato tries to stop them from chasing the injured creature, while Kei, in an attempt to seem heroic, continues to escort the girl home. Goro, meanwhile, is trying to go home himself and has walked quite a ways, but starts to hear a weird pinging sound. He chooses to ignore it and, in the first of many spectacularly gross head explosions to come, well, goes kersplat. So, here we have the first rule of Gantz. If you try to leave the perimeter of the hunt, you will get an audible warning, and if you persist, well, you die scanners style. There are other rules, but we will learn those as we go. The blonde man eventually corners the onion alien, and despite its pleas for him to stop, he fires at it with his rifle. At first, nothing happens. Then, suddenly, the wall behind it explodes. Yup. Both of the X-Guns, as we'll learn later this is because of the distinctive X-shaped muzzle flash, seem to inject some kind of microwave radiation into things and causes them to explode violently. And yeah, you will get to see this used on flesh and blood pretty often, and the effects are just as visceral as you'd expect. Cornered again, the desperate alien slashes at the Yakuza with some sort of concealed blade, and while he only gets a scratch, this prompts everyone to shoot it, blowing off its limbs and finally its head in a genuinely agonizing way. Yeah. As mentioned before, there is a lot of very detailed gore in this manga that, well, if you want to see it, I would recommend you go and read this thing because YouTube would not be okay with it. The blonde man who looked through the x-ray scope tells them that no, this was not just a human in a costume. Something is very, very wrong here. People respond differently to the revelation that they have actually just killed something sentient. The always noble Kato cries and then vomits, as does Masashi, but the others seem either unconcerned or mildly thrilled. Masashi, however, realizes that this might actually still be a mean-spirited reality TV show and says that maybe they're doing the, okay, he calls it an Eichmann test, which as far as I know is the Japanese term for the Milgram experiment, an extremely controversial psychological experiment that I am not going to go too deeply into right now. Suffice to say, it aimed to demonstrate that, while they believe they are following orders or some kind of protocol, many or even most everyday people will do cruel, horrible and inhumane things to their fellow man. Feel free to google it if you want to know more and also want to become horribly cynical in just a few minutes. They do however, realize that they're being watched, but it turns out that, while the damage they've inflicted on their surroundings is visible, the hunter and the pile of viscera that remains of the onion alien are not. Let's call this Rule 2. On a hunt, neither you nor the aliens can be seen, but you can still affect the world. However, before they can puzzle more out, they hear heavy footsteps behind them. They turn and see this. Uh-oh. A much bigger onion alien. And while it takes them a bit to twig on, you can probably guess what just happened. Yeah, you all just killed a kid because a floating testicle told you to. And now, the much scarier father has come home only to discover you covered in his kid's blood. Yeah. Remember when I said that 
Gantz sometimes out berserks berserk, and this is also where the story goes pitch black, and, well, you'll see. Oh boy, you'll see. The clearly distraught and furious Daddy Onion, who, by the way, towers over even the taller of the two Yakuza, we'll get to what happens next in just a bit, but I've always wondered if he is inspired by the tyrant from the Resident Evil game, which was both hugely popular and influential at the time in Japan, only I'm assuming with less eyeball vaginas. The Yakuza is not intimidated, and headbutts him straight in the face, while the others begin to aim their guns. However, it grabs the Yakuza's head with a hand that is suddenly a bladed claw. Blondie fires. The alien uses the Yakuza to block the shot, and holy crap! You can't see it, but you can probably guess why I cannot show you the next, honestly, few panels. This is Tom Savini levels of gore. Most of his torso is blown apart, sending blood and organs everywhere. The alien who, yeah, I've always called the Onion Tyrant, which is just fun to say, sorry purists, I'm sure he's got a proper name somewhere, proceeds to cut an absolute swath through the hunters, slashing throats, sending limbs flying, and in an instant takes them to pieces, leaving only Kato standing. However, before he can be cut down too, the other Yakuza, barely alive, frigging mag dumps the creature, sending it to the ground before he also collapses dead. And this is followed by, well, the first absolutely brilliant sequence in a manga that is kind of full of absolutely brilliant sequences. This is when, reading Gantz for the first time, I knew for a fact that I was gonna love it. Suddenly, Masashi and the others wake up on a rooftop surrounded by studio equipment. The Onion Tyrant steps forward and removes his mask, revealing the brawny actor underneath, and everyone has a laugh. It was all, indeed, part of an elaborate Japanese reality TV show, and they were the unwitting subjects of some sort of partially hypnosis-based prank. Everyone has a huge moment of relief only then we pan away to Masashi's dismembered torso, and we realize that this was just his dying dream. As his life drained away, he escaped into a happy delusion. Sweet Jiminy Christmas, that is dark, and it's one of the many moments of Gantz that really does stay with me. Meanwhile, Kato attempts to reason with the alien, who can only shriek at him in another language. He is pretty distraught about what they did, but naturally doesn't want to die himself. He reluctantly points his Y gun at the creature, but too late, realizes that he cannot kill, even in defense of his own life. The creature slashes at him, but his reflexes as sharp as ever, Kato is narrowly able to dodge, instead tumbling down the nearby embankment. Kay and the girl, who, okay, to stop calling her the girl, we'll later learn that her name is also Kay, Kay Kishimoto, and they discover the remains of the team with the onion tyrant standing over them. We also get some of our first clear glimpses of the now extremely iconic Gantz suit. Seriously, if you were in Akihabara circa 2004-2005, this thing was everywhere. The creature begins rushing towards them, and they flee, but are lucky enough for the creature to get struck by a car. So yeah, adding on to rule 2, stuff from the real world can also interact with Gantz hunters and aliens. They can be touched, 
smelled, or I guess tasted, just not seen or heard. We will later learn that they are being shifted to a different wavelength, whatever that means. However, naturally, it's only stunt and resumes the attack almost immediately. An increasingly desperate K begins to think of Kato for some reason and flashes back to his childhood, realizing that he was right. There was indeed a time when K was better than he is now and inspired by a trick that allowed him to escape a much bigger kid who was bullying him runs and slides between the monster's legs in a really daring move. And as he runs, we see that something's happening to the suit. Sure enough, K begins to accelerate. He leaps and finds himself soaring through the air as strange vein-like growths spread through the suit and okay. This is probably the number one area where my own headcanon and the official explanation differ quite a bit. For the longest time, I, and the people I would speak with about Gantz, believed that what these suits were doing is linking with the wearer's circulatory system to draw on their blood and using it to create a hydraulic effect. But according to the official explanation, what's actually happening here is a special fluid already inside the suit. Uh, Honestly, that creates even more questions. So, as it's been hard to shake, I am going to keep my head cannon here, admittedly because it's just metal as all hell, even if it's not completely true. Regardless, as we'll see more of shortly, the suits are damn powerful. They grant incredible physical enhancements, not just in terms of strength and speed, but in terms of raw toughness. And in the first of many moments in this manga, that made me crack a massive smile. Kato, at the bottom of the embankment, sees K flying through the air and is gobsmacked. Yeah, that's just awesome. And see, that's the thing about Gantz. It manages to be gritty, dark, and gory as hell, as well as having a lot of genuinely tense scenes and battles, but it also manages to just be cool, and I quite like that in a story. It helps keep me engaged. Anyway, the creature does catch him, but before it can tear into his face, Kato gets it in a headlock from behind, resulting in his arm being nearly severed by its razor-sharp claw. Oh dear, that's just grody. The way it falls limp like that at a horrible angle, ugh. And spraying blood, he goes into hypovolemic shock almost instantly, and a desperate K dashes in, his suit further hardening, and finds that, to his astonishment, he can easily overpower the creature, holding both of its arms and then breaking them into gory messes. In what I suspect might be a nod to one of the amazing fight scenes from Giver the Dark Hero, a cult sci-fi action staple of my teens that I would likely best describe as a gory Power Rangers meets the Punisher. The alien begins to plead for mercy, which, considering they just killed its kid, uh, oh man, that's messed up. And Kato tells K to stop as they were the ones in the wrong. However, suddenly, something comes flying out of nowhere, a bowler of some kind. It wraps around the alien and then anchors it to the ground. Then, with a bachi bachi, the sound effect for crackling, Nishi, the oddly off-putting middle schooler appears, holding a Y-gun. This is another ability these suits have. They can cloak, and it's almost definitely a nod to the monster from Predator, a nearly perfect 80s action horror film that might be one of my favorite movies of all time. It not only did the whole ruthless hunter thing, but the alien had a ton of wicked cool technology, including a very similar cloaking device. As an aside, it also has one of the most fascinating production histories that I have ever heard of. Seriously, go and read up on it yourself. It will bake your noodle. Anyway, Nishi tells Kay to kill the creature, but much like Kato, 
and despite his morbid fascination with the homeless man about to get hit by the train at the start of the story and all of his big talk, Kay finds that he also just can't do it. But, and this is something to also keep in mind for later, Nishi, as it so happens, is actually a bloody nasty piece of work and senses that he and Kay are not too different deep down aside from one single really important difference. This will come up way, way later in the manga, to the point where I always forget just how early it was foreshadowed. Regardless, Nishi then shoots it with the Y gun, but rather than exploding, it gets teleported away, off into space. And no, we never really learn much more about this. But at least we've rounded out our arsenal somewhat. The X-Pistols and X-Rifles are lethal, while the Y-Gun is versatile. It's capable of binding and immobilizing creatures with an unbreakable tether, and then teleporting them off-planet. As it also teleports things in slices, I think this implies that it relies on similar technology to the Gantz Transporter. K also begins to get teleported, as he desperately tries to shake the now lifeless Kato awake. Which, once again, damn man. They all reappear in the Gantz room and are astonished to see that Cuttle does get teleported back, somehow with all of his wounds healed. However, aside from Nishi and the dog, Kishimoto, Kei, and Kato are the only survivors of Hunt 1. And this basically gives us rules 3 and 4. If you die in the game, you're dead. But if even a little bit of life remains in you, at the end of the hunt, you will be teleported back and completely healed. And spoiler, this is going to come in handy. We also see that everyone is given points based on how many aliens they killed, as well as being generally ridiculed by the orb. None of them killed anything aside from Nishi, so none of them get points. But at the very least, they lived. We then move on to an extended, but honestly kind of tedious sequence, where they argue with the snide Nishi. And this is mostly to give us a whole bunch of exposition. In a nutshell, they will continue to be brought back to this room at random intervals. And when they do, they will be forced to participate in hunts. Nishi has, in fact, been doing this for over a year. A ton of others have been brought in, and aside from him, well, they've all died. We also get a theory, and yeah. As with a lot of Gantz, there are many things that will never be explained and so it's workable. When they were hit by the train, their real bodies did in fact die, but they were copied somehow and then their original bodies were destroyed or more likely made invisible. The system is, however, imperfect and sometimes it glitches. And yes, this will come up very, very soon. We also get our last rule to keep in mind, as it's going to get really, really important later on in the manga. Trust me on this. Number five, hunters have bombs in their brain, and these bombs can be detonated at any time, whether on a hunt or not. And along with trying to escape a hunt, if you were to tell anyone outside of Gantz about Gantz, or reveal the existence of Gantz in any way, the bomb will trigger. And yes, there is kind of a plot hole involving this that comes up later on, although it might not be. Again, a lot of this story is just never really explained all that well. With that, they find that they can leave, but are still, for whatever reason, invisible to the world. No, the duration of this is never really established as far as I know. Aside from, it just wears off at some point. We follow Kishimoto first, 
she goes home and finds the bloody bathtub, where, let's not say any more, but after her sister comes home and greets her, she quickly realizes that, yeah, as Nishi had intimated, the system glitched, and rather than destroying and recreating her, it straight up duplicated her. This has to be another Star Trek reference, right? Because this was more than one episode. Either way, this means that she is now a non-person and has nowhere to go. And yeah, we also start to get a bit of insight into Kishimoto's character and why she did what she did in a few subtle ways. She also finds Kei's yearbook, which says that he goes to Seigo High. Yeah, I really, really doubt this, but I will explain more when we get there. It's not important right now. Regardless, she takes off. Kei, on the other hand, falls asleep and when he wakes, thinks that it was all a dream. But he then sees the suit and the X-gun on his chair. And this leads us into the next intermission segment, which, okay, for the sake of flow, I am going to tell just a bit out of order. The next intermission starts, showing us Kishimoto sleeping rough in the park, where she finds herself terrorized by a homeless man who was touching her in her sleep. Homelessness in Japan is a very complicated topic, but it became a big problem during the lost decades, particularly due to a lot of red tape that prevented people without a fixed address from receiving welfare. The situation has actually improved substantially since then, while at the same time kind of becoming worse. For instance, there are a lot of people living in Tokyo, Osaka, and other large metropolitan centers who simply cannot find full-time work. And with Tokyo rents being bananas, we've seen a recent phenomenon in the form of the so-called cyber homeless. These folks essentially pay for a 12-hour session at a cheap internet cafe, which includes a bench and sometimes coffee, and they basically bring a sleeping bag and just sleep there every night. No, this doesn't connect to the story in any way, but I just thought you'd find it interesting. Meanwhile, Kay is back at school, and okay, so as mentioned earlier, the term Yankee is about to become rather important. It's a term that sounds very odd to people outside of Japan, and honestly doesn't really translate well. Punk or bully doesn't cover it, as it's way more intense than that. And you know what? This next bit is going to be kind of long, so if you aren't interested in the cultural stuff, well, just skip it. For everyone else, well, let's talk about Yankees. And no, we are not talking about a baseball team. So yeah, Yankee. Basically, in the context of this story, it refers to school-age delinquent street toughs who often have connections to biker gangs or street gangs, and especially in that era, were a massive societal problem that Japan simply had no idea what to do about. Now yes, the term Yankee is a lot more overarching in reality. Technically, the term is something of a catch-all for younger, non-Yakuza gang members, ranging from the Japanese pseudo-greaser of yesteryear. If you've read One Punch Man, Metal Bat is a perfect parody of one of them, complete with that distinctive strut, as well as the pompadour haircut, to teamers, more modern street hooligan groups, and other similar phenomena. In modern parlance though, Yankee mostly refers to a violent delinquent still in high school who runs with other similar delinquents and acts antisocial, engages in petty criminality, often fighting with groups from other schools, extreme levels of bullying towards underclassmen, as well as extorting money from students, generally with violence or threats of violence. 
If you want to see a bit more of this, go and read The Amazing Holy Land, which deals with this really bloody well. And if that author's name sounds familiar, he's the dude that took the reins on Berserk. Yeah, that Koji Mori. The rise of Yankee culture started in the post-World War II era, and the name is, as you likely guessed, a reference to American soldiers living on military bases, who would go on benders and act like massive hooligans in nearby towns and cities, but they also spent money like drunken sailors, at least from the perspective of impoverished post-war Japanese civilians, and they also introduced a lot of the locals to rock and roll and western movies. Kids growing up around this time came to adopt this culture and the Yankee was born. However, they weren't a massive problem until the lost decades, where they became part of the whole culture clash I mentioned earlier. Young people realizing that their generation was not going to get a slice of the pie and were in fact completely boned compared to previous generations became really angry and really resentful. And this led to many rejecting Japanese cultural harmony and tradition, and instead idolizing criminals, gangsters, bikers, and punks. As mentioned, these were quite a big problem in the era, especially in the cities. And while, like a lot of the societal issues Gantz refers to, are still, well, issues. This was so much worse back then, and this was due to, at least in part, the extremely lenient laws pertaining to young offenders, where, for instance, even the most notorious cases, such as that of Boy A, a 14-year-old serial killer, only received a brief anonymous stint in a reformatory. And this means that even where these Yankees perpetrated serious violence, resulting in the police becoming involved, the worst that would happen to them is that they would go elsewhere for a year or two and maybe change schools after, then be reintegrated into society without any real lasting repercussions. This meant that, especially back then, there was Nothing you could do if one of these groups of Yankees decided to target you, other than change schools yourself. Teachers were, well, let's be honest here, are reluctant to intervene, not only due to limited power to apply consequences, but due to fears regarding personal safety. This meant that you would have to go to the police, which now might at least result in them visiting your school, but back then wouldn't have done very much. The police considered things that happened inside families and inside schools to be outside of their bailiwick, and, well, they had their hands full dealing with a massive surge in organized crime, drugs, and the like. Plus, your school might well punish you or your homeroom teacher for reporting it, as this would damage the school's reputation, and for this reason too, it would most likely just be ignored. This is still a very common way of handling bullying and petty criminality at schools now. Hell, I recall a particularly nasty incident at one of our local schools back in the early 2000s. A teacher tried to intervene in a situation where a Yankee was terrorizing and extorting younger students, and this resulted in him sneaking up behind her and pushing her down a flight of concrete stairs. Only then did the police get involved due to her being put in intensive care, and this was due to her family reporting it rather than the school. As far as I remember, he didn't even deny it, and got less than a year in a pretty cushy reformatory out in the country, and had to attend another school after release, which if I recall was actually nicer than the original school. The kid who reported the initial harassment actually had to move to another town due to him and his family being threatened and their house getting repeatedly vandalized by the other school Yankees, and I might be wrong, but I think the teacher was moved to another prefecture too. However, 
Again, things have actually improved somewhat in this regard. Due to the numerous anti-bullying mandates having come down, mostly after a lot of really nasty incidents occurred, and the laws have changed slightly to allow all the juvenile offenders to be treated more harshly in the case of violent crimes. It still happens, and bullying is still a massive problem in Japanese schools though, which we will discuss in greater detail after hunt number 4. If you want to know more now, I would go and watch my early series on another. Just please don't mind the jank ass audio. Anyways, back to the intermission. Sure enough. We learn that one of Kay's classmates is being extorted by the school Yankees, and it turns out that as he's tapped out, they have quite cruelly allowed him to pick their next target and he, as per narrative causality, picks Kay. One of the Yankees demands 50,000 yen, about $500, by the end of the day, only... Huh. We see that Kay actually brought the Gans suit to school and quite intelligently puts it on under his uniform. So, let's call this rule number six. You can take your gear out of Gans and into the real world and it'll still work fine, meaning that you can get up to all sorts of shenanigans unless you violate rule five and risk exposing Gans to outsiders. However, well, there's another big downside to this, and we will see it when we get to hunt number two. Regardless, Kay has taken the school boss, a term for basically the toughest kid in the gang, revealing that he's quite a dangerous martial artist. But the school allows Kay to basically ignore his strikes and easily overpower him. While they are briefly intimidated, the Yankees tell him that this isn't over and... Uh, okay, like a lot of stuff in Gantz, while this does come up again a bit later on, it never really becomes plot relevant. I have to wonder if this is Oku engaging in a bit of retroactive fantasy the way we all do about our childhoods. Hell, I know I still do this even now. Back at home, Kei finds Kishimoto dozing outside her door, leading to a sequence that… yeah. This is one of the bits that gets frequently criticized for being weird, but honestly, I don't mind. Let's take a look. After some discussion, Kishimoto asks if she can stay with Kei as a pet. She has a pretty fan y shower sequence that… Uh, no, I can't show you any of while he runs out to buy condoms. However, he quickly realizes that he has completely misread the entire situation. She means that she wants to live with him and basically be taken care of, not that she wants to engage in any sort of relationship. Kay does push his luck a little bit, but yeah. This is why I quite like this sequence, as, while we do get some more exposition, there is a lot of character stuff going on with him that is rather subtle. As soon as he realizes that Kishimoto isn't into it, and is actually pretty messed up in her own right, he doesn't pursue the matter any further, despite him being evidently annoyed and let down. See, this is K. He can be a salty little douche sometimes, he can be a coward, he is completely obsessed with getting laid, he's rather selfish, and isn't always the nicest or most charitable, but somewhere deep down, under all the fluff, he's actually a good dude. Kato, as described earlier, though, isn't going to a good school like Seigo. And okay, yeah, when I said that I doubt K actually goes to Seigo, well, Seigo is a very nice school and very exclusive. Any kid acting out to that degree, even in that era, would have been kicked out. But, uh, very briefly, schools in Japan are their own thing. If you're lucky, 
fairly wealthy and come from a decent family, plus you have strong academics, you can probably get into a decent high school. It'll take a bit of interviewing and tests, but you'll find something. Otherwise, unless you are great at sports, your luck is going to vary. But in the city, you could well end up getting stuck in a dump school, and those can be rough. Especially if your family isn't supportive. As to get into anything better, you really do need to attend interviews and write tests, which requires some money and a lot of driving around. Kato is indeed attending one of these dump schools, and much like K, runs afoul of a local Yankee group after he defends a younger student from them. This group, however, is way bigger and nastier and plans to jump him later on before letting their boss, a heavyweight boxer, what are you doing in high school, called Onizuka, rape him. Oh, Gans. However, Kato gets word of this and ambushes the boss, catching him by surprise on the crapper and beating seven shades of hell out of him, which secures his safety. Kato is kind of a badass, despite his meek nature, and yes, we will learn a lot more about him and why he is the way he is as the story goes on. Let's just say, there is a reason he's a fan favorite. We then get an extended segment where we are introduced to some more characters. First up, a particularly nasty Bozoku dude who, okay yeah, Bozoku. Japanese biker gangs were another big problem in that era, and they scared the ever-loving hell out of people. They actually date back to the 1950s and came into prominence during the 70s social unrest, which I haven't talked about in a video yet, I might end up doing in this series. But they only became a big problem in the 80s and 90s. Now, a lot of folks even within Japan are quite familiar with and even romanticize the Yakuza, the Japanese Mafia who've been around for basically forever, but sort of keep to themselves. Unless you go looking for them to borrow money, buy a gun, or something along those lines, or unless you're involved with certain specific industries, you probably won't even know they're there. The closest you might get is having to pay some protection money, or getting ripped off at specific bars in Kabukicho, but by and large, while they can be pretty damn evil, they generally don't mess with Joe Public. Bozoku are another matter entirely, translated as something like the violence and reckless driving tribe, I'm not kidding. There used to be huge mass rallies and convoys of these dudes. They quickly developed a reputation for being indiscriminately violent, and while they did generally just brawl with other biker gangs, or the occasional random beatdown, they also raised complete and utter bedlam from time to time, blocking roads, breaking windows, and attacking civilian vehicles, as well as, well, civilians. However, much like Yankees, legal reforms that allowed the police to more easily apprehend and prosecute Bozoku substantially and rapidly reduced their number in the late 2000s and early 2010s, and while they do still exist today, you just don't see that many of them, so fortunately the era of the psychotic biker convoys is long gone. Anyways, said Bozoku and his small group get lured into an ambush by a larger gang and, not to mince words, get beaten to death. It's kind of brutal. And sure enough, they get zooped up by Gantz. Next, we meet an actual named character, Hojo. This absurdly good-looking, I think male model, and minor celebrity, full name Hojo Masanobu, is being perved on by women at a local CD shop. 
However, it turns out that he's trying to avoid his stalker, nicknamed Southercore, after the now iconic long-haired ghost from the Ring series. He borrows a bike from one of the girls chasing Kim and agrees to let her ride behind him, but it turns out that Southercore quietly pushed her aside and got on in her place. His eventual super freakout combined with a dozing truck driver proceeds to cause a huge accident, killing him, Southercore, an old lady, and her grandson, and dragging them all into Gantz. Okay then, our last little bit of intermission shows us more of Kei and Kishimoto's relationship developing. They're rapidly becoming friends, although he clearly still has intentions. She does confide in him somewhat though, telling him her backstory, a sadly common tale in Japan, even now. Her mother is a Kyoiku mama, which is probably best translated as helicopter parent or tiger mom, although this is a little different, and as far as I know predates both of those terms. Basically, a Kyoiku mama is an insanely overbearing woman that drives their kid to study all the time to their extreme detriment, not permitting them any sort of hobbies, social life, or relaxation, in the hopes that said kid will go to a good school and thus a good university. It's still a huge problem now, maybe even worse than it was back then, and is also a very, very complicated socio-cultural issue, but has been a trope in anime and manga for at least 30 years. If you recall Chi Chi's relationship with Gohan in Dragon Ball Z, that's what's being referred to there. It has unfortunately resulted, or at least been blamed for, a lot of kids becoming shut-ins, developing a full-on phobia of school, or even, much as Kishimoto did, straight up snapping and attempting soy sauce. She remarks that she's actually genuinely happy to be dead, even if it means being a Gantz hunter. K, however, still has his eye on the main chance, trying to think of some way to make her fall for him, and then, to his joy, she says that she's in love with someone at last, before absolutely crushing him by telling him that, guess what, it's Kato. Yep, that's why they call it a crush, mate. You generally end up in a bloody heap on the floor. Oh, and if you're wondering about Kay's backstory, and why he lives in an apartment alone at 15, well, if you watch our Satogashi video, you might get a hint. But otherwise, we will learn much more later on. Short answer, Japanese schooling is bananas. Kato, on the other hand, has a very rough living situation. He's an orphan who was taken in reluctantly along with his little brother by his extremely abusive relatives. He wants to get out with his younger brother before lasting damage is done to him and for them to find their own place. <sighs> Kato, you're such a good dude. Lastly, we see that Nishi isn't just a bit of a little creeper. The kid is actually a budding serial killer. This has to be a reference to Boy A, right? Going around killing stray cats with his ex-gun. He's genuinely excited, having the feeling that tonight is gonna be a good night. Yes, thank you. Now that song is in my head too. And sure enough, teleporting begins. Just like that, our new team is gathered. And next time, we will get into Hunt 2 as well as the Hunt 2 intermission, which is where the manga really, really starts to take off, and to be honest, kind of just keeps getting better and more insane from there. Who will live, and who will die this time? Well, that unfortunately will need to wait until the next video. Anyways, before we finish for the day, I want to give a huge thanks, as always, to my fantastic patrons, Cheddar, Piece of Yeast, El Espresso, Cheerful Satanist, Starwin Marwin, Question Man 6, Kel Core, Jacob Ramsey, Crazy, 
Opinion Custard, Wargill, Hunting for R2-D2, Inukia Koji, Rose Montgomery, Lance Goebel, Rafferty, Aaron Arnold, The Hedgehog Gamer, Simone, The Empress, Jake, Ranger Danger, Lucian, Andrew James 82, Polite Crow, Cheshire Quill, and Squid. If you want to see more like this, why not stick around? Subscribe, bell, you know the drill, all that good YouTube stuff. If you want to hear me say your name, get on the credits list, as well as getting early access to most of my videos, one or two unique videos, some fun perks on the Discord, and you know, help Mrs. Owl and I out or buy Baby Owl a present, and ensure that this channel survives into 2024, why not take a look at our Patreon? If you want to chit-chat about, well, basically anything, drop by our Discord. Otherwise, take care, my friends, and cheers. This is The Owl, signing off.